Hi everyone, my name is Nasif Mahmoud. I'm an application engineer at Rodent Schwartz, and it is my pleasure to welcome you all to another edition of Rodent Schwartz 35 webcast series. The topic that I'm going to talk to you about today is on over the air testing of connected products with multiple radios. Now, when it comes to conformity testing for products with combined radio systems, the standards are a bit vague. So we got a lot of customers approaching us and asking for guidance on how to perform this kind of tests. And we have worked with a lot of key players in the industry to come up with a strategy on how we can do exactly that. And this is exactly what I'm going to talk to you about for the next 35 minutes. Now, we see a lot of exciting applications in different segments uh, where you have a lot of those manufacturers trying to connect their products to the internet. And with that, I have taken the liberty uh, to list down some of the, you know, more exciting applications that we see. And for um, that cause, let's start off with uh, smart home uh, applications where you have a lot of uh, home appliances getting connected, a lot of smart lighting application, home automation, uh, smart door locks, smart metering. And uh, this is a space that is uh, developing rapidly and what this means is that uh, the spectral crowding is also another issue that we need to take care of. So now that we don't have at the moment so many products connected to the internet means that we still have um, a challenge for the future that we need to take care of now. Now moving on, we have uh, the airspace uh industry segment where we see a lot of uh you know private drones uh being sold with a lot of connectivity uh on offer and so this is another area that is growing rapidly navigation is a huge huge uh, application area that is uh already quite widespread but uh, the, the applications are growing very very fast uh, smart city applications are another um, segment that is uh, very interesting uh, it is currently under um, R&D. The rollout is going to come in the next couple of years. And this, this only means that the uh, RF uh, spectrum crowding is just going to be another massive issue that we were going to have to solve. Uh, transportation. So we see a lot of the car manufacturers uh, pushing on this topic quite a bit to um, facilitate uh, car to car communication, car to grid communication, car to infrastructure communication. Uh, the debate is currently on what kind of uh, technology they're going to support at the end of the day. Is it going to be 802.11p standard or cellular based uh, V2x standard? Uh, but whatever the case is, uh, they both are going to transmit on the 5.8, uh, 5.9 uh, gigahertz frequency band. So we are going to see a lot more spectrum um, congestion on, on that particular frequency. So it is something that we need to uh, look at now and not wait till, you know, the thing has been rolled out. So this is going to be another issue that we need to take care of. Medical is another segment that is extremely um, fast paced and, and it is developing very fast. However, medical has the luxury that uh, there is the NCC 63.27 wireless coexistence standard for North America and FDA actually recommends that the device manufacturers uh, follow that guideline and basically qualify their products according to that standard. But uh, the standard is um, a few years old now. So it was uh, published in 2017. And there is going to be an update coming very soon. So most likely at the end of this year, if not, then probably the uh, start or early next year, something like this. So there would be a revision on the NCC 63.27 uh, wireless coexistence testing standard. Uh, for uh, smart factories and smart uh, industry, it is another segment which is uh, exploding at the moment. So there is a lot of uh, applications in this area. And if you have visited a fitness studio um, or a gym uh, in the last couple of uh, months, you probably noticed that a lot of those uh, machines, the, a lot of those running bands um, 
are now uh, equipped with uh, some kind of uh, connectivity and um, uh, wireless uh, or Bluetooth uh, connections. So uh, that is also another area which is exploding uh, in terms of innovation and, and connections. So this goes on to tell us that uh, there are going to be a lot more wireless coexistence issues as we uh, go into the future. And this is not a bad thing. This can be managed, but we need to perform uh, very um, impactful tests uh, right now. So wireless coexistence testing is another uh, huge topic, as you can uh, already understand. But today we're going to talk about bidirectional um, communications and how to uh, ensure that we are also good neighbors. That means we, we can uh, a test for transmitter performance as well as receiver performance. So that is exactly what we're going to uh, talk about uh, in this webcast. Now, let's take a look at the connected data flow where we have um, the wireless modules being integrated into different products, right? So into smart TVs, smart refrigerators, but the list goes on. We saw it in the last slide. And how they work is that this wireless communication module, they support multiple uh, air interface technologies to connect to some kind of server system uh, and to facilitate back and forth uh, data traffic. And then the data is basically presented on the application layer. So you get to see it on your screens or whatever, um, you know, application uh, there is, uh, it, it is supported uh, through this kind of uh, data flow. And what we have is that a handful of uh, wireless uh, connection technologies. So we have the LP WAN technologies uh, where you do not need a lot of uh, data rate. So you would have um, LoRa or ZigFox uh, in the, the sub gigahertz uh, range supporting those kind of applications. We have, of course, the WLAN and, and Bluetooth standard. Uh, supporting a lot of the higher data rate requirement applications, uh, as well as Zigbee is very popular when it comes to smart home uh, applications. And for uh, connections that require some kind of mobility, you would see a lot of the cellular uh, LTE based um, standards in uh, use. Now, uh, jumping into today's topic from a test and measurement point of view, uh, we have to perform bidirectional communication testing. So we need to understand what exactly uh, are those parameters that we need to test for, right? So we can divide this in two parts. One is the transmitter testing part. So what we transmit out of our devices. And we also need to make, make sure that uh, our receivers are performing as it's supposed to, uh, given uh, this harsh RF environments. So we need to perform RF coexistence test for uh, the, the receiver side and for the transmitter side, we need to perform a lot of the uh, output power measurement, the spectral power density measurements, and of course, uh, spurious emissions. So we do not have, uh, you know, uh, third order harmonics and, and uh, you know, blocking out somebody else's transmission. So this is something that we are going to see how to perform uh, this kind of tests. Now, let's take a little bit of look at coexistence uh, because I think this is an important topic uh, which, which needs to be uh, stressed a little bit in detail because it's a very new form of testing. Of course, a lot of the people uh, who are watching this uh, webcast would say, hey, we already do EMC testing or EMI testing uh, and, and uh, wireless coexistence, where does this fit in? Um, this is a very new form of test, so let's look a little bit inside uh, what it contains. So there are different kinds of coexistence tests. One is the in-device coexistence. So this is normally done by the chipset manufacturers who would design their chipsets with multiple standards on the same chip. And what they do is they perform conducted tests. And what conducted tests are, they connect directly to their chip. Uh, bypassing an antenna module because they don't really have to do um, a uh, complete integrated test. They just need to make sure that they do not have coexistence issues on the same chipset. So they will perform some kind of, uh, yeah, conducted in-device coexistence test. Now, as a device manufacturer, the company that basically takes 
this kind of integrated uh, chipsets and, or wireless modules and integrate that into their product, they have to, of course, connect to an antenna module, uh, which comes from perhaps another uh, third party antenna supplier. And when they ent integrate these two products together, uh, they have a completely new product, right? And it is then their responsibility to basically um, perform the certification and compliance tests. Of course, when you integrate different kinds of products together in your uh, original product, um, what happens is that because of the integration and the placement of uh, certain elements, so let's say the antenna module, you would couple with the body of your product, perhaps, and you would, of course, see different kinds of interference sources. So this is something that nobody has tested till now, right? So the chipset manufacturer did not test uh, in a combined uh, fashion. So he would not be able to guarantee you that you do not uh, see this kind of interference or um, the, the antenna manufacturer would only ensure you uh, the antenna radiation patterns and, and some kind of other parameters, but he would not uh, ensure you combined performance. So this is your responsibility. And so you have to figure out uh, a test plan that basically qualifies all your products. And this is, this is something that is uh, yeah, quite complex. And if, so I have a, a picture of a washing machine, as you can see, but you have also different smaller uh, products, so products with a different uh, smaller form factor, uh, let's say a wearable product, uh, which the user can easily uh, take from one region to another region. So let's say he bought the product in Europe, the product was designed for Europe, and then he travel to North America, and now your product needs to be uh, compliant with the uh, local regulatory uh, uh, specifications. And now it becomes your challenge uh, to also, you know, have a product that is conformed not only for Europe, so not only the CE certification, but you also have to undergo FCC certifications. So we need to perform proximity coexistence test. Uh, normally, these kind of tests are performed uh, on a device under test that is uh, in its final form. And so conducted measurements are no longer possible. This means that we need to perform over the air testing or some might even call it radiated testing. And this is exactly what we are going to discuss uh, in the next sections. Now, let's take a look at the first part of our challenge that is to perform uh, transmitter tests. And for this test, we want to test the following parameters. The first one is the output power, the power density, and the spurious emissions test. And for this reason, we need to first of all connect our device under test with um, a radio communication tester. And what we do is we set up an active communication on the different standards. So the one uh, radio communication tester that we have on display is a CMW500 and it can emulate end-to-end -end networks for both cellular communication standards as well as non-cellular communication standards. And when we have this active communication setup, uh, our device under test is transmitting at all times. So it becomes easier for us uh, to perform these measurements and it also cuts down on time if we did not have an active communication standard. And we can also control different aspects of the wanted signal. So we can select the type of modulation we want on our wanted signal, the bands at which we want to test them. Uh, we can uh, select the frequencies, the channels, and um, all that kind of parameters uh, for the wanted signal. And when we are doing this, we want to uh, measure the RF spectrum, obviously. And for that cause, we have a spectrum analyzer. Uh, we also have a real-time options on our spectrum analyzer. So you could uh, choose to use those modes as well. But the one we are gonna do today is just uh, uh, not the real-time spectrum, but just the spectrum itself, yeah? And while performing these measurements, uh, since we also want to cover the spurious emissions, a uh, good rule of thumb is cutting down the, the entire uh, spectrum from uh, 400 megahertz to 18 gigahertz into three different subbands. So we can filter out also uh, the upper uh, frequency spectrum and, and measure certain chunks of the spectrum at a time um, 
to get uh, you know more uh, meaningful results but if you choose to do the entire spectrum in one go it is also possible but it would just not be an impactful test so anyways we place our device under test on a turntable and rotate it 360 degrees while maintaining this active communication standard and we can look uh, at the device under test from all different angles uh, at the same time so this is what uh, the test would look like yeah and once we are done with this we will have basically our uh, result documented we will see the result uh, at the end of the presentation so uh, i'm going to leave the results uh, for for later now moving on to the receiver test side we have to perform uh, proximity coexistence as we already mentioned uh, and this is a very complex topic because uh, to understand what are those interferences, uh, what are those wanted signals where we want to test, uh, we need to create a test plan. And what we have here is a modular test plan that uh, we have come up with. It is very much in line with the medical standard that I uh, mentioned at the start, the NCC 63.27. Uh, and let's go through the different modules so you, you get a better feeling of uh, how the, the test plan is optimized. So the first one is risk assessment, where uh, we def basically define the type of device that we have, the technologies that we support, and the frequencies that those technologies uh, are operated on. Uh, the intended use, so we figure out where exactly the product is going to be used. Uh, what the interferences uh, sources look like for, for the intended use and the radiation pattern. So this is another test that I'm going to show you how to perform. Um, then we have to determine the functional performance. So we need to figure out the physical layer KPI. So is it uh, throughput, packet error rate, blocker rate? Um, so these are the KPIs that we need to understand um, under normal conditions. And uh, we can also mention some application layer KPIs like video and audio quality. And there are, of course, uh, methods how we can test them. And then we have to test uh, or understand what are the worst case scenario looking like. So how does my KPI suffer uh, when the worst case scenario is realized by our de uh, device under test? And then finally, we need to uh, recreate that same environment in the lab and perform tests. So this is basically how the test plan looks like. Now let's uh, go into different modules and, and understand this a little bit better. So what we have is a tier based system where we categorize risk. So how is this risk defined? So the risk is if the functionality of uh, these devices are compromised because of a wireless coexistence issue, um, does this failure in functionality cause a bodily harm to the user of the product. So if yes, then they are more risky products. So thus they will be categorized and enlisted in higher risk tiers. So this would be the tier one. Um, tier two is where you have uh, a little bit less risky products enlisted. And uh, then you have the uh, yeah less risky tiers. So tier four and tier three are the less risky ones. Now, of course, automotive infotainment, not all applications are very risky, but let's say e-call, for example, uh, this is something that we need to consider because uh, if there's an accident and the car does not send out an emergency call with the appropriate uh, GPS uh, navigation coordinates, uh, this could uh, mean life or death for the person who is involved in this accident. So you, you kind of have to uh, understand uh, those kind of applications and, and enlist them on the right kind of tier because then uh, we can take a different approach on how to test uh, these products. The second uh, step in the risk assessment process is to understand uh, what are those technologies that uh, my device under test supports and basically categorize them uh, uh, and, and uh, list them down in terms of frequency and uh, bands that they support. And then finally, we need to perform a risk assessment matrix um, analysis where we basically take one standard. Let's say if the WLAN is my wanted standard, 
uh, which is operated at 2.4 gigahertz is LTE uh, 800 megahertz um, an interference source for me um, most likely I would say this is not so it's it's marked in green so this is something uh, we can ignore so the LTE 800 megahertz is an interference source that I'm going to ignore uh, LT2.6 does not overlap exactly on my WLAN, uh, so this is of moderate risk, so you could choose to ignore, you could keep it, uh, depends on you. Um, WLAN with another WLAN communication is of course something that would overlap and, and create uh, uh, coexistence issues, so the probability of coexistence or the likelihood of coexistence is high, and so this is something that uh, we need to consider and, and of course test. Uh, and Bluetooth um, is uh, another source that could also hamper the WLAN transmissions or uh, WLAN reception in this case. And so this is something of uh, interest that we would definitely use as an interference. Uh, the same goes for Bluetooth. Bluetooth and uh, WLAN is basically quite similar. And so, yeah, we can uh, say the same and, and basically use one another as an interference source. Uh, LTE 800 is another uh, nice example to look at. So if your device is supporting LTE 800, uh, you could check like this. So LTE 800 with LTE 800 is of course a problem, but LTE, LTE 800 with uh, 2.6 LTE or WLAN and Bluetooth, they don't really overlap. And so you could ignore them as, as uh, your interference source. But LTE 800 communication, so the receiver would also be uh, vulnerable to other transmissions of uh, the LP WAN technology. So uh, LoRa and ZigFox, so you could use those two um, standards as your uh, interference source, as well as Zigbee. So Zigbee is in certain regions um, uh, deployed on the uh, sub gigahertz frequency band. So uh, this is another uh, interesting uh, interference source that you could consider. So this is how you do a risk assessment matrix. So the next module uh, on our test plan is the intended use case determination module. So we kind of have to understand the type of RF environment that our uh, devices are going to see in real world operations. So let's take a few examples and uh, try to figure out what kind of RF environment they see. So the first one is a patient monitoring system, uh, such as a medical device. Um, they are normally placed in hospitals. They are found in homes and, and the patients wearing those sensors are also uh, walking around uh, trying to go back and forth uh, from hospital and home. And so in hospital, for example, there are a lot of uh, different types of uh, wireless networks available, right? It's a very messy RF environment. You see a lot of patients walking around, so a lot of hostile rogue ne networks uh, basically on the move. And uh, there are, of course, a lot of uh, different computer systems, computer networks that are uh, trans transmitting data back and forth. And so this is a very messy environment. And so uh, the, the likelihood of uh, coexistence uh, issues is very high and so we have to recreate this kind of uh, network or uh, RF spectrum uh, inside our lab while we try to qualify this kind of uh, medical products. So this is a very strict uh, test uh, routine that we have to follow for medical devices. For home appliances, yes, washing machine and coffee makers, uh, they are placed in the kitchen or, or sometimes in the bathroom uh, for washing machines. Um, they are not seeing uh, the hospital-like RF environments. They see a very stable time invariant uh, RF spectrum. So there are not so many people walking around and stuff. So the different uh, RF environment needs to also reflect in our test approach, in the test routine. And so what we build in the lab later on has to reflect this uh, reality. Uh, cars is another, uh, the, the car infotainment is another application where you see the car in different scenarios and uh, they have different kind of uh, RF spectrum uh, that they are, uh, yeah, going to see in, in real world operation. And so this is the type of uh, uh, RF spectrum that we need to also recreate in the lab while performing the test. Now, the second part is to understand the different types of uh, interference signal that we are going to use. So they are normally wideband modulated signal. They have uh, wide bandwidths. So we need to take in consideration what kind of bandwidths we want to use and uh, 
uh, we can place them in band and out of band uh, uh, interferences and then try to test them and of course we need to understand the amount of uh, interferences uh, interference signals that we want to test our product with and finally we need to understand the different uh, characteristic of the radiation pattern after we integrate the antenna module on our product so at this point we need to perform an antenna uh, characterization uh, measurement on our finished uh, final form product so this is how it looks like so first of all we need to um, create this active connection with our radio communication tester that we saw uh, when we were discussing the transmitter tests so we need to now make sure that we have an active communication with our radio communication tester and our device under test. And then we need to take a look uh, at the RF spectrum at all times with our spectrum analyzer. So this is uh, recommended on, on different kind of standards. So it's a good practice to, to have this uh, spectrum analyzer analyzing or checking out and monitoring the RF spectrum while we make these measurements. And then we need to connect uh, network analyzer to antenna uh, that are going to move around in spherical fashion. So we want to measure the radiation pattern of the transmission that is uh, coming out of our device under test. So this is how we do an antenna radiation pattern measurement. And when we have this antenna radiation pattern measurement uh, done on our uh, dot, we can use this in our, yeah intended uh, use case definition. So in the next module of the test plan, we have to determine the functional performance of our device under test in really good conditions. This means that we have to perform a functionality test to determine physical layer KPIs uh, in scenarios where there are no interference signals. So different standards uh, would have different um, yeah, physical layer KPIs like data throughput, packet rate, or blocker rate. So let's uh, consider WLAN. A good communication connection is when the packet error rate uh, does not degrade more than 20%. Uh, for LTE, the packet error rate has to be better than uh, 2%. And um, if you are considering data throughput, so it's, it's easily understandable, no interferences mean that you need to have a very good data throughput. Another parameter which is not very common, but a lot of people uh, discuss this uh, quite uh, uh, often uh, is the modulation quality measurement. So in terms of EVM, error vector magnitude, this is a parameter that you could use to understand the signal quality. However, the receiver performance is not something that you get a good feeling of using this parameter. So yeah, it's, it's depending on you where you stand on the issue. Now, a lot of our device under test um, or, or this uh, connected products, they, they have some kind of uh, display system and, and uh, speaker system integrated. So you could also use, uh, you know, application level, level KPIs to determine the functional performance and what is satisfactory. And so you could check uh, video quality or audio quality uh, in terms of your uh, KPI documentation. And then we need to finally understand what the worst case scenario looks like. So uh, if we would uh, put them in uh, cell edge conditions, so if, if the, the connection uh, signal strength drops to a certain level where the, the KPIs are really at the very uh, edge, that would be my cell edge condition and introducing multiple interference sources uh, at this um, you know, scenario or at this uh, connection uh, status would completely kill my connection. So this is something that is called worst case scenario testing. And this is something uh, that we need to understand for our device under test and basically recreate them later on the lab. Now, uh, the first test setup. So we saw different tiers of risk categories uh, for different products and here we have uh, the first test setup for testing tier three and tier four uh, devices. And in this one, you already know certain parts of it. So the first one is, of course, 
uh, to make a connection with our radio communication tester. And in order to boost the signal inside our shielded chamber, I will come to the explanation of why we have a shielded chamber in a bit, but let's look at this one. Uh, we want the communication signals to be um, boosted, so we use an optional uh, power amplifier that basically boosts up the signal inside the chamber and provides the wanted signal. Then we have our SMW, which is our interference uh, signal generator. And with this, you can generate basically any kind of uh, cellular uh, 4G, 3G, 5G, uh, NB-IoT signals, as well as uh, non-cellular, so Bluetooth, Wi-Fi signals. Uh, you could also choose to um, you know, design your own custom digital modulated interference signals as well. And with this, we provide the interference signals up to a frequency of uh, six gigahertz. So you basically have the uh, yeah, possibility of uh, placing your interference signals wherever you want. And finally, we are going to take a look at the spectrum analyzer, which is monitoring the spectrum at all times. This is uh, basically the test setup for measuring the physical layer KPIs uh, for your wireless coexistence tests. Uh, we have an inspect, uh, inspection software uh, that uses uh, off-the-shelf HD webcam and uh, microphone to monitor the application layer uh, KPI, so video quality and uh, audio quality of uh, our DUT, if, if there are some. And this is the test setup for Tier 3 and Tier 4. Now, coming back to the explanation for shielded chamber, is that we want to be testing in an environment where there is radio silence from the outside world. So we want to be able to control every aspect inside the shielded chamber uh, in terms of wanted signal and uh, interference signal. So this is a proper test. And if we have uh, contamination, so RF contamination from signals from the outside world, of course, uh, you would not be able to locate uh, the exact reason of, of your interference problem, right? So that's why we want to control what happens inside the shielded chamber. And so we, we have a shielded chamber in uh, our testing application. Now, there are... Um, different ways of, uh, of uh, qualifying, you know, uh, products for wireless coexistence. And uh, one is defined, actually four uh, types of uh, setups are defined in the INC C6327 standard. But uh, those are for medical uh, devices. Of course, you can repurpose them. And uh, that is something that we uh, kind of uh, did here and we have the test setup for testing tier 1 and tier 2 products for wireless coexistence and the system uh, kind of looks a little bit different uh, where um, the differences are. Let me uh, enlist them here. So first of all, we have uh, interference station. Here we have used an SMW200A to generate uh, interference signal, but we have also combined a lot of those um, smaller uh, vector signal generators uh, and, and connected them with the SMW. And what you get is up to eight interference signals, which are fully calibrated and controlled from the SMW uh, graphical user interface. And the possibilities are you can do all forms of, uh, you know, cellular and non-cellular interference signals as well as you can put fading on uh, the, the signals itself. So you could simulate different kinds of motion. You could uh, have multipath signals as well. So you can test really a very complex scenario inside the lab. Uh, what we already saw was the CMW being used. What you don't have here is a power amplifier, uh, but you can of course, uh, as an option, bring it in and, and boost your signals. That is also possible. And we have a spectrum analyzer to monitor the RF spectrum at all times. And we have once again, the inspection software to uh, monitor the visual and uh, audio aspect uh, if, if you need. 
Now, the thing with the wanted signal and, and the device under test, so a lot of the medical products uh, don't really need a wanted signal. They just want to see what happens if you would have, uh, you know, a lot of uh, interference signal that are very powerful. Uh, and, and if the functionality of your device uh, fails or not. So you kind of have to understand when to use the wanted signal and uh, apply that uh, whenever required. So if you have a different kind of uh, tier one, tier two product uh, where you need a wanted signal that is operating with a WLAN or Bluetooth connection or needs some kind of uh, network emulation. So that's when you bring in your wanted signal. So this is uh, basically a setup that we want to focus on this side of things. And from a device uh, under test point of view, you kind of have to understand what is that uh, that you require for your uh, test. Now, I saved the measurement results I saved for later, uh, and here we are with them. So first of all, what we discussed was the transmitter test where we uh, made a, a turntable 360 degree rotation tests and tried to monitor the spectrum uh, for RF uh, output power and uh, spurious emissions. And this is what we have. We cut it down in three subsections, and here you have a transmission uh, at 800 megahertz around that uh, where we had an LTE connection. So the device under test was transmitting at this frequency as well as GSM was being also transmitted from our device under test, but the spectrum looks uh, quite clean otherwise. In the middle section where we made a scan from one gigahertz to three gigahertz, you can see some transmissions coming out of our DUT uh, at the 2.4 gigahertz uh, frequency band. We had at that frequencies Bluetooth and uh, WLAN active. So this was coming out of our device under test. And on the upper section, uh, it is quite uh, clean, I would say, because uh, yeah, there are not uh, any transmissions at those frequencies. So this was the transmitter test. Now, um, for the wireless coexistence test, I have uh, the very stripped down version of it. So we did some wanted signals, uh, which was the WLAN network. That was uh, the active connection for our device under test. And we introduced a Bluetooth um, interference source. And this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, the, the blue carve is basically our WLAN connection and the small uh, one megahertz uh, interference signal is uh, our Bluetooth. And in the second case, we had the same WLAN connection, but in uh, the interference, uh, we used instead of a Bluetooth an LTE connection. And the results look something like this. Uh, you have your Bluetooth communication uh, interfering my wanted signal, which is the WLAN, as I mentioned. And in this case, I am sending on the WLAN network a data traffic of uh, 1000 packets. So I'm sending to my uh, device under test uh, using the WLAN connection. And I have uh, configured the WLAN with a 16 QAM 24 Mbps uh, connectivity. And when I switch on my Bluetooth um, interference, I see that my packet error rate uh, started increasing. So more packets were being lost. And over a transmission of 1,000 packets, I had an average of 15% packet error rate. Uh, on the second case, we had the same WLAN connection, but uh, in this case, we had an interference of uh, LTE. And I was sending, instead of the 1,000 packets here, I was sending 2,000 packets. And I switched on my interference signal and gradually increased the power level of the interference uh, tone. Uh, interference signal and you can see that the gradual increase in in packet error rate as as the power level of the interference increases and what we had was at the end an average of 19.5 uh, percent packet error rate uh, over a transmission of 2000 packets over my wlan uh, network to our device under test so this is kind of like a wireless coexistence test uh, to get an idea of no and finally, what we have is uh, the different products that we sh uh, saw today was a, a few bunch of uh, vector signal generators from Rodent Schwarz. We had our inspection software. Uh, we did not see the results of this, but uh, that is topic of another video. Uh, we saw our spectrum analyzer uh, screenshot. We saw some applications of a 
shielded chambers. So we have uh, different types of portable shielded chambers. The, the one we recommend for smaller products uh, up to six gigahertz is DST 200. We saw uh, network analyzers from Roland Schwartz. We saw some network emulators for uh, cellular and non-cellular communication. So the CMW 500, but what we did not see is for 5G, we have the CMX 500. And for uh, battery uh, performance measurements, we have a bunch of oscilloscopes, uh, power probes, uh, very sensitive power probes, uh, might I add, and power supplies, right. With that, uh, I have come to an end to today's uh, webcast. Thank you for your uh, attention. If you have questions, please feel free to email me your questions. And of course, uh, visit our web website for more information. Thank you.